Hey everybody, so today we are going to be going into part one of a two-part series that I am doing with Connected Data London. This is their channel if you want to go and check it out. I'm going to be featured on their channel next week. I'm going to be talking about responsible AI. So if that is something you are interested in, make sure you go and check that out or follow me on LinkedIn so you can see all of my updates and make sure you subscribe to my channel and ring the little bell so you get notifications when I have new videos. So today we are going to be talking about Internet of Things specifically used in energy efficiency. Now, this is something that can be used in an entire city, an entire building, or in your own home if you do have smart sensors in your own home at this point. Now, modeling really helped in the machine learning application of this project because it made it a scalable model that others could enhance and, and make their own for their own use case. And it also made it reliable so that the results that they saw from their own study could be used and expected in other studies as well. And if this sounds interesting to you, well, let's go get started. So I am joined today by George, who is going to be sharing with us some modeling and machine learning projects that he has been working on, one specifically that is focused on Internet of Things and some environmental factors, which I think is very exciting. Um, a lot of people are very interested in both of those topics right now. So, George, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yes. It's my great pleasure to be uh, joining you uh, here today, Ashley. So, I'm George Anadiotis. And, well, one thing I usually say about myself when I'm forced to introduce myself is I wear many hats. So, uh, one of those is a data modeler, which is, I guess, uh, a common uh, thing between uh, the two of us. Uh, so wearing that hat a long, long time ago, um, it's almost 10 years ago by now, I was involved in a project uh, called uh, Besos. It was a research project funded by uh, the EU. And it was, as you very uh, correctly pointed out, uh, it was about uh, energy preservation and energy efficiency. So this is going to be part one of a two-part series where this is the first interaction that we're going to have on my channel and then I want all of you to go over to the Connected Data London channel where they have a lot of really great talks, very similar topics to what I talk about but from a variety of other people. Uh, and then part two, I am actually going to be on the Connected Data London channel. So hopefully all of you that are on that channel get to come and watch some of the things that I am going to be doing. And the very the, the impetus of everything that we're doing is I do have a master class that is going to be taught at Connected Data London this year. So if you are interested in that, please go and sign up. All right, so let's get started. So George, if you could describe for us what, what is um, the importance of energy efficiency and the Internet of Things? How do those things play together? Uh, to give a very uh, specific example, which was precisely what my team was doing, so the uh, the key goal was to um, uh, enable energy efficiency in buildings uh, by doing well little things really, like uh, you know turning off the lights when you're not in the office, or uh, uh, turning off monitors, or uh, reducing or adjusting actually the uh, the level at which air conditioning works. These kinds of small things, if you add them up at scale, they really do make a difference. This is what the project uh, actually uh, found out. In order to do that and not have you know, people having to manually perform these, these micro actions, the idea was to use uh, sensors and hence the Internet of Things uh, connection. So to give you an example, we used sensors that uh, could measure uh, how much light uh, you have in a room. Or, um, the, uh, or how much heat, or uh, even things like uh, airflow. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of sensors uh, that combined can give you lots of information about what's going on in a building, or actually even outside the building, because uh, that's also part of the energy efficiency play. Mm -hmm. And so what was the goal? I mean, if you're obviously trying to save on energy, there's a lot of different ways um, that you can do that and a lot of different reasons. You know, maybe you want to decrease your energy bill or you want to be better with the environment. Um, so what are some of the, the reasons that you started this project? Well, actually both. Uh, it was a research project and in some ways I would say it was maybe ahead of its time. 
So the key idea was, well, uh, to make these uh, targeted interventions at uh, buildings and then be able to coordinate those across buildings in uh, what people in this domain call smart grids. Uh, you may have heard uh, the term before. And it basically has to do with the fact that, well, uh, the uh, the grid system through which we all get power in our homes and offices and so on is kind of antiquated, let's say. I mean, mm -hmm. it works and it's reliable when it doesn't break down when, like, <laughs> like it did for people in Texas recently, for example. But yeah. it's not really very, um, uh, very adjustable, let's say. So mm -hmm. when you have uh, highs and lows in demand, uh, the, the system finds it hard to, to adjust to those uh to those variations so far yeah so let's go ahead and show that and while you're getting that up i also want to mention that all of the resources that uh, george is going over are also going to be in the description below if you want to go and research a little bit more about what he is talking about uh so and george i also have to say i actually have some experience doing this as well i was creating knowledge graphs for one of the major uh, energy uh, suppliers in the uh, Northeast, uh, oh, I don't know, probably three or four years ago, because they were looking at uh, an influx of smart vehicles and electric vehicles. And they had to make sure that because there were so many electric vehicles getting plugged in in the city and then in the suburbs at certain times, they had to make sure that the grid wouldn't fail because of that. So I'm familiar with this. I'm excited. This is something that I might actually have something else to talk about. All well, right, so go ahead, take it away. That's that's really nice. I didn't know that. So this, this is a surprise for me. Well, that's that's good to hear. So yeah, uh, this is the uh, the uh, overall uh, picture of, uh, of the project. Uh, it was centered around what uh, we called back then open trustworthy energy service platform. And the idea was that uh, you would be able to integrate from the very, very small. So imagine those tiny sensors that I talked about earlier and actually aggregate those to the level where uh, you can get interesting information for people making decisions. So whether that building is performing uh, better or worse compared, for example, uh, to that building uh, last year, or mm -hmm. compared to the building across the street, or whether you can save uh, your whether you're saving energy or not, and what you could possibly do uh, to to do better in that respect. So uh, we built uh, the project, built uh, what was called the decision-making cockpit for those people uh, mm -hmm. that would aggregate uh, all those metrics from all those sensors in all those buildings and help them make those decisions. Now, uh, the way that machine learning uh, was relevant in that context, because uh, I, I promised you I would refer to machine learning when we started talking about the project, and yeah. I haven't yet. So this is the right moment, I think, to uh, to make that connection. So when you have all those uh, metrics coming in from all those sensors, uh, the goal was to automate things such as, for example, you know, the simplest possible example we always gave people was like, okay, so when you're not in that room, you don't really need to leave the light on, do you? Mm -hmm. Well, many people actually make a point of switching lights off, but that's not all people. And besides this obvious example, there are also less obvious examples with less obvious uh, devices and less obvious ways uh, you can save energy. So air conditioning is another huge saver if you can uh, if you can fine tune it and there's you know like really really tons of things so this is why we thought that uh, it would be a good idea to use machine learning to do mm -hmm. all those adjustments because you know the number of rules that you would have to have mm -hmm. in place and the complexity mm -hmm. of those rules is really not that easy to manage so the way that you were using machine learning with this is you had all of these sensors that were giving you a plethora of information that's something that mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people struggle with is that time series data and the volume of data from Internet of Things applications. And so what you were doing is you were using that machine learning to take all of those rule sets that you had for energy saving and to understand based on the trends that you were seeing recommendations or at least findings from how energy was being used. Is that about is that correct? 
Yes, yes, that's that's exactly right. That was the that was the idea. So, again, to return to the simplistic example of uh, well, switching the lights off when you leave the room. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you have a sensor uh, that gives you metrics such as uh, luminance. Uh, you have another sensor uh, that gives you metrics about uh, the amper uh, power in in that room, and you have another sensor that gives you metric. Uh, about uh, the temperature in that room. Now, all of these metrics, all of these sensors give you actually an array of, uh, of metrics. So one of the key things you need to do in machine learning, I mean, obviously, besides setting up your, your data pipelines and uh, deciding what kind of algorithms and what kind of frameworks you're going to use, actually, what many people say, and I kind of share that that notion is probably the most uh, interesting part of machine learning is what's called feature engineering, which basically is like, okay, so you have all those metrics, you have all those facets, let's say, in your data. What is important for your specific use case and how do you actually connect one to the other? And this is what we actually had to do. So after the the nice part of unboxing all those sensors and you know plugging them in and having the data coming uh, starting to flow, we we're like, okay, so right, we have all that data. How does you know how does that relate? How do all these metrics relate to one another? Mm -hmm. And how do we get things like, such as you know amber or luminance or temperature? How do we get from those, from you know, a gazillion sensors, to something decision makers can actually mm -hmm. make sense? And this is the part where we knew that we had to inject some data modeling in the picture. Mm -hmm. Because even for people who are uh, proficient in machine learning, they actually need to have some kind of understanding about the domain they're operating in to be Absolutely. able to be. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I have many people that um, feel that they can just understand just the machine learning aspect. And I understand what these algorithms do and, and how they interpret data. But if you don't understand the context, and that's a big thing with my master class at Connected Data London, if you don't understand the context of what does luminosity mean compared to a human sitting in a room? Well, if it's dark and they're, they're um, an avid book reader, luminosity is pretty important to them because they want to be able to see the book. But if they're only maybe watching a television, they maybe don't need as much luminosity. So that kind of mm -hmm. contextual information is so important to the machine learning aspect. You know, energy is pretty well established domain, which mm -hmm. means that there are already uh, data models that people have been using. Actually, in fact, there may be a little bit too many of those data models. And that was part <laughs> of the problem to, to deal with as, as data modelers, because uh, there's a bunch of uh, standards out there. Uh, you know, the, the common uh, joke about, uh, well, we have too many standards. Let's introduce another standard <laughs> to uh -huh. alleviate that problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to get to make things even worse, not all of those standards are compatible with each other. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, part of the job we had to do uh, was actually um, have a look around, uh, do some research to see what what is out there, and then mm -hmm. figure out okay, so what works with what, and what mm -hmm. should we be using. This standard that we were using was only basically only had some what we call some base classes. So. Mm -hmm. It only describes some key concepts in the domain, but we had to extend them uh, to make them usable in our in our use case. As you can probably see, if you are at all familiar mm -hmm. with uh, UML modeling, this is a UML data model, mm -hmm. and there's a reason for this choice. Actually, uh, this was the modeling choice made by the people who uh, expressed this standard as a data model. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in the uh, in the actual technical details, uh, it was XML-based. Mm -hmm. So it was a plugin that worked on top of XML with uh, Eclipse. And basically, uh, when you use that, you could import uh, some classes modeled in uh, XML in a way that mm -hmm. this plugin could have and you could also extend, you could basically play with the model, you could extend it, you could navigate it, and you could do all these nice things that uh, data modeling people do.
Uh, like I said, this was 2013. So actually long before, uh, well, the whole knowledge graph, uh, you know, explosion <laughs> came about. Yeah. So back then, uh, semantic modeling was uh, considered a little bit exotic, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the consumers of this data model, uh, the people we were addressing were basically uh, software developers, people who would have to uh, take this model, but well, actually we had a number of uh, target audiences for this. Like I said initially, uh, it was aimed uh, also for people developing machine learning algorithms. And same back then as it is now, most of those people are not really familiar with uh, semantic modeling. Yeah, the reason I wanted to uh, to share this image was uh, basically to show uh, what was part of the of the core model and what was the what were the extensions that we added so uh what uh what's pictured here in this kind of bluish uh, color is uh, our extensions versus what's pictured in this pink is color which is the core model mm -hmm. so you can see things such as asset or activity record or power system resource which are really quite generic and uh, this is the, the kind of thing that the core model uh, included and we added some extensions to those. So uh, we added, for example, things such as uh, KPIs, so key performance indicators, mm -hmm. or users, locations, measurements, which, if you think about it, they're also a bit generic. Uh, but at least they're more concrete that, than uh, what we originally uh, had to, to work with in, in the core model. Mm -hmm. And the idea that uh, people working, because this was um, actually a project with many partners from uh, many states across the EU, and each of those partners uh, specialized in something different and also had a different use case to work with. So the idea was to keep the model um, kind of extensible so that people could uh, extend it, well, so they could uh, do uh, instances of that, that match mm -hmm. their use cases so even potentially add their own extensions if uh, they couldn't do what they needed to do by uh, by adding their instances. I think that's important to note too because I think oftentimes, and especially on my channel, I'm always talking about standards. Use the standards. Standards are a foundation to start from. You almost always have to extend it and make it custom to your use case. And a lot of people might say, um, well, then why use the standard at all? Well, because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are very smart people that do this every day, and they made the standard to help you so that you have a leg up. You don't have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nice to see that not only did you use a standard and you extended it, but you also made it still extensible enough that it wasn't such a strict model that others couldn't also use it. So I think that's a really smart move. At the end of the day, George, how how did the project go? Did you fulfill your your goals? What was the outcome? Some of them were actually products that were uh, that were made available in the market. So uh, all these sensors and all these machine learning algorithms uh, mm -hmm. were kind of instilled in a couple of products. Uh, one of them was called Hue. Uh, the other one uh, was called uh, Mate, and both of them. Uh, were the kind of software plus hardware products that uh, basically were addressed at uh, people or organizations managing buildings. And uh, the results were quite uh, quite impressive as well. So on average, uh, we had between 20 and 30 percent uh, savings in energy where those products were deployed. You know, we were talking about how this this massive amount of data that was very complex and had a lot of different rule sets really needed that that machine learning um, approach. But if you could summarize, what was the value of having a model that went along with that machine learning? I mean, do you do you have a sense for what what would the project have looked like if you didn't have that to to fall back on? I think without a data model, it would have been extremely difficult for, for the people uh, designing uh, the machine learning algorithms and the people working, the software engineers working with the sensors uh, to see the bigger picture. So 
how does you know this time sensor that uh, that gives you uh, that gives you measurements about temperature, for example, how does it relate to the decision that somebody has to make about the operation of this building, both on mm -hmm. the local level, so building manager, and you know on the on the regional level, so people mm -hmm. operate in the grid in the entire city, for example. So I have all these sensors. How you know how does how do the measurements from all of those actually connect to each other? And mm -hmm. what's more important, for example? So how do you actually, you know, see the big picture when mm -hmm. all you have is this granular, tiny, fragmented time series data? Yeah. It just tells you that it's very hard to, uh, to figure out which facets of your data you should be paying attention to if you mm -hmm. don't know what the data is about. Well, and I would also say it makes the work that you did extensible and scalable too, right? Because if you didn't have a model that you were using, um, one of your colleagues that was also, or one of the partners that you had on the project might not have been able to pick up what you did and extend it for their use and get similar results. I mean, that's the point of your research is to show, hey, if you use this, you use this approach, you can expect some of these results. But if you didn't have a model to base that off of, it would be kind of a guesswork <laughs> approach, which yes, is not great. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, George, so going into the wrap up, I wanna thank you very much for joining me. Um, for anyone that is interested in learning more about how models can be used uh, in your machine learning tasks, make sure you check out my masterclass and also check out uh, Connected Data London. It's going to be a great, uh event all right and so make sure you stick around i'm going to put a link to the second video that is going to be over on the uh, connected data london youtube site so i'm going to put that down below so you can go and check that out because we have more to talk about all right and so with that i'm going to let you all go and thank you for watching